the three suggestions that are, I'm just throwing out to the community is that the IUCN SSC carnivorous plant group be resurrected, um, that uh, the checklist, the CITES checklist is redone, seeing we have a lot more new uh, species, particularly of Nepenthes. Um, that only covers, obviously, the three genera under CITES, and that um, if, if everybody is in agreement, you might want to start looking at the CITES listings of those, spe of those species as well. And, I don't know, you can take it from there, really. Uh, I mean, I'd like some actions maybe to send to the ICPS that maybe that would be sent to the board uh, that we could discuss now and, and um, that it goes to the board and maybe we could have some sort of solid actions from this meeting uh, apart from, uh, you know, a wider discussion of some of the issues that were brought up through everybody's talks. Okay. <laughs> I've got a question. Yeah. Why, I understand the permit system, I understand the CITES system, I understand trade in endangered animals, plants, etc. Why doesn't CITES stay within the concept of, I would like to go on expedition to somewhere, I would like to collect some material from that somewhere with the blessing of the CITES organisation and with the blessing of the country that I'm going to, and bringing that material back to the lab, <coughs> i.e. the tissue culture lab, to make zillions of them. Now, I have got kosher material, blessed by CITES, blessed by the country of origin, etc., etc. I have now produced 100,000 rajas. I have a sale for, from Walmart to get them there next week. Why do I need a permit for each one of those rajas going to Walmart? Because I've already done, I think, the, the essence of CITES in the beginning, so I have a piece of material. It can be likened to, I'm in the ivory trade. I go to one of those countries with elephants that are doing a cull, and I get an elephant tusk. I take the elephant tusks to my country, it's China or Japan, I have the paperwork for getting it, receiving it, exporting it, now I put it into my factory and I have all my people in the factory making little Buddha pendants from it. Does it mean that I need a CITES permit for every little Buddha that's been made out of this one giant legal tusk? And using that analogy, I think CITES has stepped over the line to what we were trying to create in the first place. We're trying to get kosher starter material into collections and scientific communities, etc., etc. But with the sharp tools we've got today, we can knock up zillions of plants. We can use seed, roots, leaves, tissue culture, of your rescue, there's a million techniques we can use. But we're, they're not elephants, where you get one every 14 months. They're not dolphins, where you may get twins, but mostly one. They're not whales, that the Japanese are blowing away at a thousand per year in the Southern Oceans as we speak. CITES has got out of its box with the in initial intentions of CITES and saving rare and endangered <coughs> things. And, and our plants have got tied up in this mess and been put alongside of whales, dolphins, koalas, platypus, etc, etc. So what I'm proposing is, is there any way that CITES, which I believe in, can work more with everyone and smile and give their blessing and their help and their inside information if one of our scientists or labs or what have you wants to go to the top of some mountain and some shithole in the back what woods of nowhere mm -hmm. and have permission from that and we've got legal material. Yeah. There, yes, and then I know I keep banging on about this but this is exactly what the orchid people have done and what reason to sort of resurrect the group or to find 
yourself a voice, because just remember CITES is made up of all your countries. It's not some sort of entity, alien entity in itself, even though you might think so. <laughs> it's made up of Germany, it's made up of France, it's made up of the USA. So everybody gets a yes. vote, and, it, and it's a two-thirds majority. It's not um, consensus like CBD. but So there are processes, and as I said in the talk, you have the Plants Committee. So that's where your scientists from your country bring a subject up, and that's where the orchid people did. And they said, exactly as you said, we've got all this legal material, we've got these hybrids, um, we've produced all this identification material, this we think should be off-site. And, they, and I, 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 you know, it was quite a long process, yeah. so, you know, it, it is quite slow like that, but um, that's the way you have to present things, and there is a, there is a process to feed your information into CITES. Because we have, I have the feeling with the CITES system that we have at the moment, yeah. where Q is at the top of the hierarchy, no. or part of the hierarchy. Well, we are, the, we are, are one scientific okay. authority. But a big one, of, a big one. Well, no, 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 no. Q as an institution, is, is, I know, as an institution, we are a scientific authority. Uh, maybe we do, we do a lot because we do a lot of capacity building, so our, our uh, profile might be a bit larger than other scientific authorities. I'll go with large profile. Okay. As far as myself and the colonies are uh, concerned, <laughs> that is the holy grail of botany, Q. Yes. Okay. What I'm say, about to say, no one's really thought about. But back in the days of Vish and Saunders and all these guys when they used to come to Borneos and, and Europe's and what have you, and they would rape and pillage the bush and bring the plants back for auction for the stove houses of the Victorian era, they are technically, as per, as per CITES intentions of their laws, every one of those plants is an illegal plant. No, because it's pre convention <coughs> But every convention, CBD has pre-convention material because it would be so complicated to... Of course, but know. haven't you physically broken the intention of what we're trying to get done? You've already broken the law. Well, it's, it happened before the, intent, before the process was But the point in place. is, you are not holier than holy. No, 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 I'm not saying that. I mean, that's why I'm saying we have a lot of processes even in our institution. So what makes, we... what makes your organisation and the other organisations God where you no, say... No, I'm not having a debate that Q is God. Uh, okay, uh, leave him out of it. Why do we have to <laughs> bow to CITES? Because your country signed up to it. Each party signs up to it and puts it in the legislation. You can become, you can come out of CITES if you want. You can contact your management authority and say, "I don't want to be a CITES party anymore." If, if you if you totally disagree with CITES and what it stands for, then you remove yourself from the CITES process. Me get one of my Australian shiny bums to do that. <laughs> for you to get one of your shiny bums to do this, I get a life. <laughs> well, you know, you're you're asking me something that you know. I'm telling you, I'm giving you the answer. So. And, and what I'm trying to get across too, but it's falling on deaf ears, but I don't care anyway, but I'm saying well, it that's anyway. That's a bit okay, That there is a place for CITES. Yes. There is a place for CITES, but they've it. got out of their box. They need okay. to come back a, a, a few steps and to physically, let's look at the situation and do it the proper, intelligent, common sense way. Okay. To, to see all this paper going from uh, here to there. Would you allow a question? Uh, because Hans has. Maybe explain where is the head of the CITES Committee? Because it's not the head of the CITES. It's in Geneva in Switzerland. Alan, so maybe answer your, your question. No, but, 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 but that's just the Secretariat. The, the CITES is made up of all the parties. Yeah. So it's not the Secretariat's job to make a decision because it would have to go to the conference of the parties and be voted on. That's what, well, what I'm trying to advise you is that there is a process to do. You might say, oh, it's not going to work. I'm, I, I can't be bothered. It doesn't work with CITES. But I'm just advising you that this is the process. If you want a, a, a bigger profile yourselves as, a, as a experts, in this room, I would advise you to, for example, one of the things would be to resurrect the, the Species <coughs> Survival Group because then you become part of a bigger thing, which is IUCN. Can I tell you that uh, I'm 62 this year and I've been playing around these since I was 16 years of yeah. age, and the first I heard about CITES yeah. was out of the blue 
I didn't even know anyone was discussing it or putting this thing together. It just arrived out of nowhere. And the first thing I see on the list is we've got Biblis Gigantea is priority to appendix two or whatever yeah. it is, rare and endangered. It's up there with elephant tusks and all those things. It's now being delisted. So that is how CITES moves. You know They've why? Delisted. Because there's none left in the suburban area. But is that because of international trade or is that because of habitat loss? No, that's through embarrassment. Well, they embarrass the plants into it. <laughs> no, they... I put that to my authorities that don't you guys know that you're bulldozing a plant that you're saying needs CITES protection? And they're going, well, hang on a sec, we want to put houses there. So bugger CITES will bulldoze it. But that's a domestic, that's an internal thing. It's got absolutely nothing to do with the fact that... But when I went into that site there and dug up what I thought was a good uh, combination of the colours on you, the pinks were over there and the whites mm. were over there, I got those home because they're only babies. I got them up to big. I actually pollinated them all. I made a heap of seed and I spread it all over the world. Mm -hmm. And eventually those plants died. But at least I got the genetic diversity of that area in collections and botanical gardens all over the world. But I broke the CITES law and I went to my authorities and told them what I'd done and they were shocked. Mm. But I didn't go to jail because they knew what I did was the right thing. It's as simple as that. All these conventions and laws and what have you. So what do we do? Just fold our arms and sit back and watch them getting ploughed into the ground? No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give you a process whereby from a CITES point of view, not an internal domestic issue, that you can get a voice and get and get those plants out into distribution so that the genetic diversity is out there, as you're saying. Mm -hmm. whether, it, whether it has worked in that instance, you know, there's probably for every success, there's a non-success story. Well, why does Rob need 12 rolls of dummy paper across this floor? And and perhaps that, and you I, let yeah. Rob explain, because that would be a nice place to introduce also the opinion from horticultural trade, but I see Andreas, likewise, a representative of horticulture, may comment. I would be interested in your, your suggest of uh, resurrecting this uh, specialist uh, group, which, to be honest, I would be glad to take part also. But um, my, my concern is how realistic is it that if, if a group uh, of, of uh, people who are, have, have knowledge of a special field how realistic is they get hurt? Is, is it, I mean, I, I'm... I can only give I'm, you... I'm, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know how to, how to say it in English. Uh, I find it positive in one way, on the other hand, I'm thinking, well, is this just activism? Will this just uh, be, be lots of work without any outcome? Or is there any realistic chance for, especially, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a... a businessman in, in this field, I also work, have worked scientifically, but for, for my feeling I, I always uh, have the idea well, somebody who is making a business with rare plants, he must be a bad guy anyway. <laughs> so how, how realistic is this to, to, to get a voice in, in this uh, really constellation? I, I honestly will say to you, I cannot... <laughs> me just as a person on this panel say to you that it's going to be the, the success and the, the million dollar answer to your question but what i would say is it's it's a facet it will be one facet i would if you put all your eggs in that basket then i i would i wouldn't advise that because it's the same as anything i would say this is i'm only making a suggestion and uh, this is for you to discuss it's not for me um i don't work for iucn or ssc um, I've had experience running a specialist group, so I can give you advice then. Uh, all I'm saying is I'm advising you that it could possibly be one facet that you should use in your toolbox to advance a lot of the cases that I've heard over the last two, three days, a lot of the problems that you have, and it, it, it won't be probably the solution to it, but it, you know, it'll, I'm sure it will kickstart a lot more debate and will get your profile of carnivorous plants back on the map. When you go onto the IUCN website, the carnivorous plant are missing out of there. So the cycad people have a voice, the palm people have a voice, the crocodile people, no carnivorous plants at all. How, how would, would such a uh, resurrection, or, resurrection organization, how would this be structured, how would this work, 
how would be the... <coughs> that's for, that's uh, not for me to decide, that's for everybody to, to... What you have to do is you have to have a chair of um, the group, so maybe you could discuss who you want as a chair. They have to provide a CV to IUCN, and then they make a decision on that. And then you obviously get your members, and I would advise you to get your members from, you know, taxonomy, trade, um, exit you, in situ, whatever, all the expertise. I would advise not to make it an enormous group and that everybody can get, be a member. It's not like the ICPS where it's a general hobbyist group. You want a very narrow, uh, a very focused, sorry, not narrow, focused group that can, you know, you as another person write into that group or you contact them and say, look, this is the problems I'm having. So they have a work program. Unfortunately, why I can't guarantee anything, it's a voluntary group. It doesn't come with money or anything like that. It doesn't, you, you, a lot of this is voluntary groups. I think okay, but at least this is something that the AUCN officially uh, regards such specialty groups as official advisors. Uh, yes, I mean, you'll have to get the wording from IUCN, so whoever you nominate as a chair. What I suggested to a few people last night, maybe, is a few people have a bit of a discussion with them. Uh, Rob, do you want to say something about yeah. maybe talking to somebody in Sri Lanka? Or yeah. Yeah, no. <coughs> Please remember, the topic of this discussion should be uh, ex situ conservation. So if we could come up with some points uh, indicating what action could be taken in the future, what uh, type of uh, organizational structure needs to be established from your point of view and what is actually your daily problems with the status quo. Okay, I mean, I, I'll just, just close. I, I understand exactly what Andreas is saying because the Species Survival Commission, we've worked on it before, it's a lot of work and if we don't get listened to, we've wasted a lot of, a lot of effort. But as Madeline's saying, it's something, it's, it's really our only course to get to work within CITES or within the IUCN to try and get something changed. But if I can just, um, Madeline, can I ask you, you mentioned the orchid people worked hard to, to get the, these things delisted. Were, did, were they successful? Yes, because certain hybrids of orchids are now, uh, if they follow certain criteria and the shipment follows that criteria, they do not require a permit. So can, can I ask, if, that, if they, that's been decided for orchids, why is that not automatically applied to, to, to our hybrids, for example? Because you have to back it up with a lot of... Um, it's exactly the same it's logic. Different. No, because some organisms are slightly different. Also, is the identification problem. That was the, one of the biggest debates oh, within that. Our Nepenthes is easy to identify because those hybrids come with a flower on them or they come with certain you know, right. packaging or something like that. So that's the little nuances you'd have to work out per... I mean, customs per can't identify down to species level anyway with Nepenthes, so, so if, if they can just recognise the Nepenthes, that's as far as it's going to go. But ex situ conservation, um, one of the big impediments to the trade in artificially propagated plants, and we, I think we all agree that the trade in art prop plants is, is a good thing, the impediments are obviously the permits. Um, and I, I've got a question. In, if we are exporting to Europe, or particularly to the UK, we get all our export permits. Now, mo most countries, don't. that's all they require. We got our export permits, and they'll let it to you know, Singapore, Hong Kong, wherever, that you can just import the plants. Here, we have to get a matching set of import permits for every single time we do it. Now, I know that one of the reasons is because of CBD, what they want to make sure the seeds were legally collected and ask questions. Now, but that's a requirement on the site, it's legal and sustainable. Right. Yeah. But you've done that now at least 20 or 30 times for me, but every single time I have to get the permits again. Um, is there no way that, that we can actually license the nursery um, to actually to, to, to waive the requirement for this massive import permits? And 75% of these, by the way, are for artificially propagated hybrids, you know, which, which require a page of permits. And uh, to me, I, I think that's not very logical. Well, they've, they've gone one step by doing I mean, you're very lucky having that artificial propagation exemption for Appendix 1. Unfortunately, there's not many carnivorous plants on Appendix 1. Um, that would be part of a debate that would have to go to the Plants Committee because the Plants Committee, is under CITES, informs the conference of the parties. So that's the sort of information that you start need to get out there and say, this is legitimate and sustainable trade, 
we would like to suggest this and etc uh, etc et so mm. a lot of these things just can't because you do it for ivory you can't do it for another plant or animal group it doesn't always work that way um, and, and I just want to make a clarification SSC doesn't give you an automatic inroad in some ways into societies it's not it's not a party to societies no, I, I see it. Yeah. To, to whom societies listen I to you see in, like I said in my talk IUCN um, critically look at the listings um, of the proposals that go before the conference of the parties. It doesn't mean that what they say is, is you know, gold or anything like that. It's just an advisory role because they have all their, their expertise within those specialist groups so that they... But did the ORCID to, people manage to get these changes done through an IUCN SSC? Well, as, as far as I know, uh, um, they part, the SSC ORCID group played a part in that. A lot of it was driven, I think, also by ORCID growers. I don't know the full history of how they down, um, uh, got there. I mean, I was there present when they were debating some of the issues, and a lot of it did go around identification because right. obviously... Because the last thing I'd, I'd say before we pass on to somebody else is that ex situ conservation of Nepenthes, which is all I can really discuss, you know, it, it, we'd, we'd, we've been doing a lot of work on this for 25 years actually, um, and the only way it can, it can work for us is if it's commercially viable as well. And, and CITES, the, 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 the rather cumbersome requirements of this kind of thing is what makes it very difficult to be commercially viable into in selling plants into Europe particularly. So if there's any way it can be streamlined, it's actually going to be good for conservation as a whole and ex situ conservation. There's no point in having all these plants in Sri Lanka if, if, if it's not commercially viable for us to ship them and sell them in, in Europe. So if, if, if we can find a way to do what the orchid people have done and find out how they did it, maybe, maybe follow the same methodology, I think it would be worth looking at that. Uh, Andreas, uh, may we perhaps add the botanical garden perspective now in the same context? Because your issues are certainly a bit different from, from trade. Yes, it is a little bit different. Uh, the, uh, but as you know, we are also importing uh, CITES material either from uh, um, country of origin, so wild, widely collected things but of course uh, sometimes uh, also buying things like, like these kind of things. So that means actually for us, uh, for exchange between scientific institutes which have a science registration number, that is for us the easiest thing to do because uh, we are, uh, uh, at least uh, our botanic garden is a registered uh, institute as well as a herbarium is, so whether it is living material or dead material, uh, we have exemptions and uh, we still have to do paperwork, that's okay, but uh, that, that is relatively easy. Uh, but we have also, uh, in the last uh, two years or three years uh, since I'm here, also collected, uh, colleagues of mine uh, collected in Papua Guinea, which has no institute with a scientific uh, registration. Not even Bogor? Uh, not uh, not, uh, not, not uh, Indonesian, uh, but uh, Papua, Papua Guinea. Papua. And so there's no one institute which has a scientific registered institute. So that means the paperwork you have to do is the same what we have to do. And in, in this case, as uh, Europe is of course not uniform, uh, we have even, even uh, uh, stricter rules uh, in our, our case because uh, we, we could actually not import on genus name but on species name. So a colleague of mine collected 800 or 900 different numbers, if I yeah, something like that art, was it? Uh, so actually you can imagine how much money uh, it costed to, to get the material here, but not only uh, that, they, that we had problems because they didn't have paper with 120 gram per square meter, but less, only 100 grams, so that was not accepted by the scientists uh, uh, people here. So, I mean, there's minor details, I, I would say, uh, but uh, um, there, there are these uh, kind of, of, of problems. And on the other way, we had also in our contract said that we would like to repatriate material again. We cultivate it here, we hope it is growing, and afterwards the uh, um, institute in Papua New Guinea should get a duplicate set back because then we are only sure which kind of name we should give. Because in the field, you know, orchid to identify orchid is not, not the easiest thing without flowers. And of course, probably many, many new species, but uh, uh, 
we are we we uh, in, in the contract is that we should bring or send them these these material back, and then the same paperwork starts again. Uh, of course, then uh, we do know the the, the um, species hopefully, and then it becomes even uh, more expensive because uh, now we we have. Uh, uh, genus ABC, now we have species ABC, so it's, you get from probably 400 names to 800 names and the, and the uh, um, uh, costs are doubled uh, in, in that respect. Uh, but uh, uh, actually for the exchange of scientific material from scientific institute with a, with a CITES registered number is actually okay. Um, the others might be uh, difficult, but it is also uh, because not many gardens, I was just also discussing with Madeleine, uh, also not doing these kind of things anymore. And that has to do actually with costs, but also uh, uh, because um, uh, also our fellow researchers are less interested in doing field work. We are doing much more via um, uh, herbarium material, DNA uh, extraction, uh, molecular uh, work, and and so on. So uh, this part of the game actually is 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 uh, uh, dwindling. And actually, if we if I'm looking at uh, the Dutch Botanical Gardens, probably we are the only one who really actively working on uh, exchanging material of of scientists uh, plants. So that's uh, also, and then of course you get in a, in a position where other people are not interested, and that is what I'm uh, hearing here also. The orchid people is probably bigger business, so they are better better organized, uh, have also more more money to to probably uh, do some things, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, so these kind of thing is. Uh, Means we have to be more inventive. <laughs> yeah, probably uh, because I actually have heard here the bulb industry is here also very big. And that means like uh, Galantus uh, snowdrops from, from Turkey or, or other places, they have, um, have made an uh, arrangement with Scientist Holland for, for these kind of exemptions. So seemingly it is possible, but you need, need to do the, the, the first the paperwork and also the massage of course. Can I ask you, um, for the plants that we're going to donate to this conservation project from Sri Lanka, um, because we're not a CITES registered a scientific institution, uh, we're going to have to go through this whole paperwork chase, aren't we? Yeah. Yes, yes, we need to get the input permits, export permits, and that kind of thing. Yeah. There are two questions from the audience. Yeah, I have a comment uh, about uh, the cooperation. It would be lovely to have uh, all these ICPS staff on board, etc. But as you see, orchid growers, uh, orchid people succeeded. And I think that the problem with CITES is regarding mo of most of the plants is the same for cacti, for succulents, for simply al almost everything. So the only way I see is really to cooperate closely. We are just a small piece of the cake and we can plant people. And that's the only way how to push things really uh, farther. And honestly, I'm quite skeptical that it can happen. But uh, I, if you would ask me for a good recommendation, that's the only way. Uh, to have a, a kind of a press from botanical gardens, let's say, but the Congress just passed in Dublin two months ago, so there's next few years to wait for another one. And then there are botanical congresses where this issue can be also somehow raised and uh, somehow uh, put it into decoration and to work somehow with it. But uh, Skeptical <laughs> is, is also what, what I just wanted to mention. I mean, you, you said uh, about the orchid lobby, and I mean, I think what should be realistic is that this is a multi million yes. dollar business. This is an industry. Here in, in the Netherlands, also in other countries, it's a big industry. And I, I, again, is it realistic to. to it's not to, yeah. to the but my comment is side. let's go with that way. But, but, orchids, but even know, together, we are not. You can say no. You can say we are microscopic uh, as compared to, to a synopsis of, of, of what's happening. Precisely yeah. the same arguments that they used uh, uh, should use work for us. Yeah. Exactly yeah. the same arguments. Yeah. They are hybrid. You can show how whether they are 
uh, put off of the wild while they are cultivated. They have uh, uh, criteria where they check the material uh, at, at borders and uh, if they are put. But of course, you have always uh, things. Where but there's also working. misuses. Uh, yeah, of course. For example, for European uh, terrestrial orchids, there's no way in the recited stage, and they just say then it's a hybrid. There's a wild collected plants, or these are even artificially propagated native plants. And to avoid this problem, they just say it's a ductile rice, a hybrid. This, then it's just sold as a hybrid. You're always going to get somebody that will bend the rules Precisely. to get their yes, lifestyle yes, yes. or whatever they want. So, so, well, with, with but the, I think the criteria can be, be used. Yeah. Yeah. They, 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 with the orchids, I think that they, the point where the, the parties voted that, that they actually would agree with it was when they felt a lot safer that this, this industry was so large that mm. the likelihood, yes, it's possible mm. you could be smuggling, you know, papier peddlers in with your orchid Precisely. hybrids, but you have to take that chance. And if it... What happens then is if you start getting reports back, that would go back to the plants committee and they would take it away. The parties would vote again, they would say, sorry, this has been abused, we're going we're gonna to stop it again. Uh, I, think, I think, Madeline, you know, I've discussed a long time ago that it's quite easy to train a customs officer, officer to recognise a wild collected Nepenthes as opposed to a properly cultivated one. They've got certain characteristics you can spot. Well, this I, is what the parties know, would want to yeah, see. Yeah, we can, we can, we can explain how that can be name. controlled. Yeah, but, but you can easily differentiate between wild collected plants and cultivated plants in general if you are experienced in, in horticulture, but you can never differentiate between hybrid nepenthes and, and, and the species. Or a, a True. We can, but, but not, not. But not, neither can they with the kids. Not even in the, in the state the plant is shipped. If the pictures are cut and yes. you just have the stem, you kind of identify, even worse for bulbs. But what the, what the, the idea Rob uh, dropped in, uh, I think it's. There, there, there is some potential. There are some nurseries which artificially propagated, which are licensed, which Rob, that there's no way Rob would sell wild collect plant, I, I, I think, because he has no need to do so. And if you just think there's a committee which could check how he propagates it, look at the labs, look at the nursery, they that he get a certificate <coughs> and that, that he doesn't need these permits anymore, that he can ship them because. Once a year, CITES and uh, come and inspect our nurseries and our labs. Um, mm -hmm. They know full well that we're that, that, they're very good actually. Before they give the export permits, you know, they, they're really sure that we are artificially propagating the plants. So anything that comes out of our nurseries is definitely not come from the wild. And do you have? And then they could just make a list. You have this, uh, these these species in your stock, and you're selling them, and you can sell them. Yes. I mean, so when we, when we launch a new species and we ask for a permit for a species they've never heard of before, they come and ask us where did we get it from and, and, mm -hmm. and they look at it in the tissue culture and they look at it in the nurseries and they do their best to make sure that it's not wild collected. That's why I brought up the definition of artificial yes. propagation. Mm. I, I think that needs to, you know, everybody needs to be playing on a, a level playing field and that's why I said that it's going to be one of the issues that CITES is going to be looking into a lot more because a lot of people have come to CITES and said we have real problems with this definition and and so hopefully there will be a lot more guidance on that so that it's really because the wording can often be very confusing as I said you know so that I think once you've got a, a, a very um, easily understood definition of something like that then uh, your CITES people in in Sri Lanka will know exactly what to look for and they can ask you those questions was it legally and sustainably collected Okay, that. I mean, you do have nursery registration for Appendix yes. 1 species. It doesn't exist for Appendix 2. Why? I don't know. I mean, that's for... Why that's just for uh, CITES listed species, just the certification, and then they can ship it without these permits? That's for the parties to bring up. I, uh, it's, if, the, it, if nobody brings it up, nobody mm. votes on it. Mm. It's, it's, it's one of those, I know it's like, to you, looking on the outside, it's like, well, it's logical. Why do you not take it ste another step further? And you said it's gone outside its box. It doesn't always work that way. These people have got a lot, you know, a lot of because jobs to do. They've got a lot of issues to look yeah, at within CITES. Because, for example, there are several kind of response, not only kind of response, many other plants which are commonly cultivated. There are billions of them. Let's say Drosia capensis. Let's say I make the ICM proposal. Let's say Drosia capensis is so rare in the wild it should be listed on a pen, uh, uh, a critically endangered. It should be on Appendix One. This would be create would create a lot of trouble to many many people selling these plants. But they did before, and just because someone discovered that it's rare in the wild, 
these artificially propagated plants, which have been traded before without problems, now that everyone would need tons of permits, you know. But, but your, because, your criteria for the IUCN um, is it's slightly different when you come to the listing criteria for CITES. You're, you're saying that this thing is threatened, but you're, you have to give your reasons why it's threatened, obviously, when you yes, do your but assessment. One, one of the birth defects of CITES was mistaking IUCN criteria for yes. CITES criteria. They all got mixed up, and most of the inclusions in the annexes are actually driven by an IUCN classification, irrespective of the factors of threat. threat just by the category itself, which is a conservation-relevant category, not a CITES-relevant category. But as everything has to be implemented in, within an incredibly short period of time with very, very limited expert input, these annexes as they stand now are actually, let's call them artificial from a scientific standpoint because uh, within the context of societies, only those species should have been included that are actually threatened by horticultural trade. And it's absolutely not the case at, the, at this very moment in time. What for, for Nepenthe, Saracenia and Dionia? almost all the plants that are included in, in the annexes. You have yourself well, mentioned no, that far more plants are on the annexes mm. of uh, societies than, uh, for instance, animals. That's for some reason because in the animal case, at least this evaluation has been made, whether it is threatened by trade or other factors. And mostly, well, for some animals there, there were political reasons as well, but uh, for most plants this evaluation has not really been done. And that's why CITES has a, what they call a review, the significant trade. Of, of they they trawl in the species mm -hmm. through this process and they reassess the trade um, issues relevant to each of those species mm -hmm. and if they don't have enough information they go back to the country and ask them they can actually close down the trade in, the, in that species if they're not getting enough information from the... Yes, certainly I'm, I'm perfectly aware of what is possible within the framework but I'm also very aware of the present situation that is far, far from realistic or workable for most uh, people involved or I can see where pragmatic. I can see where Jan's coming from. There's three giraffe, <laughs> there's two elephant, there's 17 dolphin, there's X amount of whale. We know what we've got and what we think is threatened and not threatened. Along comes Nepenthes. All of a sudden, how many is there, Rob? 150, 120? 120. 120. 129 Along comes orchids. 250,000. So we're expecting some <laughs> officer or some person who is higher than us to say, yes, you can muck about with that. No, you can't muck about with that. If we're dealing with giraffe, we've only got three decisions to make. If we're dealing with elephant, we've only got two decisions to make. With orchids, we've got 250,000. With Nepenthes, we've got a hundred and whatever. That's why With Drosseraceae, we've got 400, and so it goes on. So the whole thing is out of whack. It's, it's The whole sense of the whole thing is totally wrong. That's where the annotations come in. That's where the listing should um, say, OK, you have three giraffes, two of those giraffes um, are OK, and you just want to have that giraffe, or 250,000 species of a plant are, uh, we're going to put on it as a, as a family listing, but if you look at the orchidaceae thing, it has several annotations next to it which remove certain of those groups out of it. And that's where feeding, as I was saying, if there was other listings or delistings or a view of the listings of the carnivorous plants under CITES, you as experts would say, well, okay, we're going to provide you with this information that all but three Nepenthes are you know, in trade as artificially propagated hybrids or whatever, you know, species, remove them off them and just keep three species on there. And here's the material to back it up. And, yeah, the, and here is exactly we, where we enter a very slippery ground because, as you mentioned, this change of society status requires <coughs> member state consent, which 
I would assume to be very difficult to achieve at, at the moment. Perhaps we may add yeah. some, some input from from country of origin uh, mm -hmm. representative. What what your um, expectation would be if someday um, either an informal group of enthusiasts or a more formalized body like the uh, carnivorous plant specialist group approached uh, the conference of parties or individual parties uh, one by one asking for um, well the first step would probably be asking for a comment to a proposal that this group makes uh, with the aim to changing CITES status of individual species or in, in our case of the status of a whole genus that has been listed generally in, in one annex of, of CITES. What would you anticipate um, before uh, we'll probably, be before you, yeah. uh, could you uh, just keep this question because we, there were two questions yeah. in the audience. Maybe there was what no, was uh, related to what was discussed well, before. Maybe just you know, before. And if they don't have enough information, I was just going to say that I think that this is an opportunity now to form some sort of group. Don't take the initiative now. Let's just all talk about it at the time you would have missed the opportunity. If the last conference, if we, if, the, if we just missed the last conference. Got two years or whatever to the next conference to to get some sort of vehicle together and get your ideas across. I, I wouldn't, you know, uh, just to just to tell you that CITES process is quite slow, and I, I would always agree with that. So, but but the more important thing is because the process goes through, well, at a European level, it goes through the scientific review group then. But also the plants committee is where I think you need to direct because that's where the scientists go to and they would discuss a lot of these issues, particularly identification and, and threat level through trade. Yeah, the thing is, you've really got to sort of start somewhere. Someone's got to make a first step. If you, if you, if you try and start, try and make a conscious decision, start from here, ask the people that are interested. It's a step by step process. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But at least you've done something. Otherwise, in two, when we have the next ICPC, yes, we will probably be having the same conversations again. Very you you pull up something, you, you, you made a very brave stand by bringing this up and saying it. I think it's a good idea that we as a group move forward with it. Actually, it was my question yesterday after your talk or at the end of your talk. Um, the, the relation of this IUCN to CITES. I, I, I did not really get it yesterday, and I thought, well, well maybe I, I misunderstood something. But a, again, you, you brought this up as well, and, and now you, there is this discussion to, to form this IUCN uh, related specialist group. And my fear is uh, if I bring in my knowledge, in, in some cases, well, this species is almost extinct, this species is highly threatened then I would even be responsible to, to drive uh, uh, probably a appendix one listing for these species, which would not change anything in the wild. Because to be honest, I mean, I've also seen the appendix on local markets. You, you've shown this before, Rob, in, in your talk. But I'm not really aware of any significant numbers of plants that are uh, traded internationally, which were wild for that. I think it's nowadays not non-existent. It's not just wild plants, it's also seed. You, you know, you've got to remember that it's also that seed, because remember what I said yesterday, even for Appendix 2 material, if you if you collect seed that you didn't get national collecting permits for, you collected it from a national park, or uh, yeah. that, that was also it. But the criteria for listing a species on CITES is the CITES criteria. The, Criteria for listing a species under the IUCN red, this red um, list is their criteria. Okay, but if you would, uh, to if you want criteria to, criteria of, of endangering a species, threatening a species through trade, that's what through, yeah, and this through is trade, the then you would, would have to <coughs> list all the numerous plants. For example, the best example maybe the two appendix one species of Nepenthes. Um, 
Nipent, well, that's what I'm saying. That's why I'm suggesting to you that, Raja that as a group of experts, you. Nipentis Raja grows in a protected area. I think the old area of Nipentis Raja is National Park. It's not threatened so much by, by, by illegal poaching, of course. It's rare because it's, it's locally endemic. Whereas Nepenthes Cassiana is highly endangered by habitat loss because the, the area is cultivated. But they, uh, it's still weed. Well, then yeah. you feed that information as carnivorous plant experts, either through the Plants Committee, through your party, through the SSC group, whatever, through the ICPS group. This is the only suggestions I can come up with. On, on, Andreas, if we're not careful, we'll shoot ourselves in our own foot. You've been in Tapui expeditions, I know what you've done, and I like the things you've done. You brought material in into tissue culture so everyone can enjoy those things. If you turned around and gave these people your opinion that species A is vulnerable on the top of Tupui 1 and this species here is also vulnerable, they'll go and stick it on their red alert sheet. Okay. Your species now is threatened by CITES. And for every one of your tissue culture plants that you send out to Walmart or what have you, will have to have the piles of toilet paper that Rob's got. Yeah, that's, that's exactly the, the, the piles of permits way. aside, you can move material around. <laughs> if you can prove it was legally and sustainably acquired. And maybe the problem is also because, as Jan pointed out, these scientist criteria were made up for animals. And as Alan said, they usually have low reproduction. A dolphin has one or two babies a year. So, you, of course, if you kill the mother or the baby, then the generation is got in, extinct. But most carnivorous plants, Josa and the panthes, they are settlers of primary habitats and they produce masses of seed. Of course, poaching creates a lot of problems because every plant you take from the habitat is one less. But if someone Who's, who's taking them into vit in vitro culture takes just a few seeds which would probably have not even germinated in the wild because they have to create a large seed bank there are strategy, uh, strategy but you, you can most of the, the nepenthes apart from two which I agree shouldn't be on appendix one according to you as the experts I'm not an appendix expert okay, okay. but them aside you can move appendix two seed around you can collect it if you want you just have to make sure that it's legal and sustainable. Yeah, the, the Otherwise, everybody can walk into that national park and help themselves, which is what has happened. I realise that just taking maybe one, with certain plant groups, taking one small bit of seed is not going to kill the, the population, and it is necessary to get it out there, you know, so people can enjoy it. People but, can but, but where the problem is, people like myself who play around with naming taxa, yeah. And my score is about 125 style AC carnivorous plants, etc., etc. I know damn well that some of the things I name are making that particular species another target for, for the CITES organisation. If I was a lazy person and didn't name that species, it would still be out in the jungle there and it wouldn't have CITES bits and pieces attached to it. Anyone can collect it, shoot it around the world. But, but no problems. There's a lot of species that aren't on CITES that, you know, because they're only known from one rare population, people go after yeah, them. Yeah, but what, what I'm trying to say is that Andreas, when he names a new Heliamphora, yeah. when Andreas here names a new one, when Jan names a new species, I name a new species, we are actually shooting ourselves in the foot when we say, only known from one location, or only known from two locations. So they immediately get a priority rating of declared rare flora. And now you can't trade in seed, or leaf material, or root material, or tissue culture material, etc., etc. You can't ship something as a medley spur anyway, it has to have a name for it. Exactly. That's one of my problems, you know, well, what's the name of this thing? Well, it hasn't got a name yet. Yeah. I, just found I think if you discuss, well, I mean, the way we do it in the UK, if you have Nepenthes spur and, and you don't know what it is and you have proved that it was legally and sustainably collected, I think if you have a reasonable uh, scientific that's going to make a non detriment statement, you provide them with as much information as possible and just don't say, I don't know, and then walk away. I, I would hope, and I'm not, I'm not saying that this is always what happened, but I would hope that they would take that into account. 
Whether it does, or, you know, we could spend the rest of our lives yeah. sitting up here debating that, whether, yeah. you know, it's each scientific or management uh, committee works really well, you know. Let's face it, at the end of the day, we've all got the planes that we love. It's what it's all about. It's yeah. what we're trying to protect. Yeah. We're not trying to get out there and, and, and explode we... bombs over them. We, we love them. We want to protect them. We want to keep them in the wild. We want to be able to have sufficient material for our researchers and to send them out to the various collectors who in turn can do their own research. We want a nice, free, friendly atmosphere. At the moment, it's a them and us. Cites is the enemy and there's us. Was it actually and not CITES, it's, well, it's the member it states. The powers that be above the other level. The powers that be above yeah. our level. Yeah. And quite well, frankly, I'll move. We've for a moment. We've been running tech for nearly an hour or so. So we can switch tapes if you want to go further like this. But I really think we should try to come to some positive conclusion. I mean, okay. I think I understand the problem, if I'm correct me if I'm wrong. But basically, mm -hmm. there's a lot of knowledge. That knowledge can be used to protect species. And to inform. And to in the form of the people, and the main difference and the main fear is that there is, won't be uh, a separation between artificially propagated material which is collected legally and the stuff that's robbed from the wild. So yeah. if we can find a way of certifying or whatever, nurseries or whatever, that, that they have the legal material and we can put some kind of stamp on it, then we can have the knowledge, we can protect the correct species, and we can, co can pr provide no longer the need to take things from the wild because it will all be available. Um, Madeline, perhaps uh, I one idea. Oh, uh, I was thinking that uh, I think it's uh, uh, difficult to uh, applicate up on this uh, if we want to try to differentiate between these. Uh, this uh, from the uh, collection from the wild or uh, is uh, from cultivated back in my country. Yeah. yeah, that. But I think basically, I mean, it's just a question of trust or and or control. Correct. I mean, if you is nationally sophisticated every time, so if you can put a monitoring program on, I mean, do you have to catch everything and make things nearly impossible? Or do you have to be have a bigger filter so that you can just pick out the real problems and allow people to earn a living and people to enjoy plants? How realistic would it be, to, to make a long story short, to extend the concept of the research label not only to a handful of institutions, but on the one hand to private persons like Alan, for instance, who are doing research in the field, and second, to renowned nurseries that are regularly inspected and of which it is known to authorities that they have not uh, acted against the law or uh, committed any, any form of misconduct in the last years. So the administrative burden on the daily business would, could be relieved by just waiving them the need to apply for each and every single individual they are dealing with. That's why I brought up the issue of partnerships and networks. Because, okay, for at the moment, a registered institute, there is a definite definition of a, a scientific institute. Um, but if you're working in partnership with for, for the registered institutes, you, the material has to be deposited in the country. That should be a problem for no problem. most researchers, yeah. for instance. But it, but it has to be part of a sort of catalogued, uh, you know, blah, 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 blah. That's why I'm saying to you, you work with Perth Botanic Garden, yeah, Perth well, area. I work with all the authorities. So if you work with them and material is deposited and they're, and they're okay with it, and the material is part of their collections and you're not, you're not, uh, I don't know, not smuggling it through that institution. Obviously, that is a, a one thing that could, people could do, and that, which is why they're quite strict on that label system. Well, can I tell you that CITES, as far as I'm concerned, has nothing to do with me. 
for, for, for my activities, yes. sightings doesn't come no, in. But, what I'm but saying I is do see Big Brother in sightings. I've got enough to contend with where we have laws of priority ones to four, declared rare flora. Yeah. You're looking at the guy who broke the law by collecting a presumed extinct plant. But what I'm saying is that, that plants, if we're talking just about CITES, I'm saying that, say you were working on a CITES material and you worked in collaboration with oh, a, listed, a registered institute, that is one way that material could get into research and could be, it could be shared around, I, I believe if we, if we want to protect a species, we've got to make it so common that all the collectors of the world who want that particular species can get access to it through Rob or someone else, yeah. can buy the thing at a reasonable yeah, price yeah. and get it into his yeah. or her collection. Yeah. Why would you go to the trouble of smuggling it out of the jungle? But when you lock the whole thing up and you make it so hard for people trying to propagate these things by the thousands, there's collectors out there with a kind heart, but they still want a Raja. And they'll get a Raja whether or yeah, not yeah, the good so really or yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. But if you flood the market with yeah. a species, there's no need to go into the bush to get one. Yeah. We don't want one of those. Yeah. Well, as I said, it, you have to separate this slightly out to the processes that CITES use, uses that may, as you've all told us, are quite stodgy and don't work very well, to the actual collection yes. bit where it's, as long as it's legal and sustainable, that's fine. We want the blessing. Yes, yeah. and, and that's what CITES is about yeah. as well. You know, that's why they, they uh, um, a lot of people were seeing that species were threatened through trade. But I can understand that the, the processes that might not be working, but the the premise of CITES that as long as you legally, you know, because the majority of species are on Appendix 2. Mm. It's only Appendix 1 material, and really that only affects some of those Saracenias and two Nepenthes for, for us little group here. But you've got hobbyists in one state can't move the plant across that border to that church bazaar and sell that alabamensis there. They can only sell it there in their own state. But, but that is that is a USA. That's a domestic I mean, that's, legislation. Come on, it's crazy. Isn't it? Yeah, well, it's crazy or not, but that is yeah. that's domestic legislation. Yes, Madeline, but uh, the problems with CITES are always domestic legislation. There is no such thing as international CITES legislation. It's it's always the member states that create the problems. Uh, however, we need to to address these member states who are either countries of origin or mm. those who make procedures particularly difficult for research. I think we have sorted out the research aspect to a certain extent now because affiliation to, to registered institutions shouldn't be a problem for the majority of researchers. As long as you but follow that how about How about the second part of my proposal to extend the research label or something similar to really commercial nurseries who, yeah, that are accredited but still with a clear commercial interest. It, to it reduces the pressures on wild populations if you can get these plants out without all this business. Yeah. Well then, I, I would suggest that you uh, write this up, you give it examples, and then you either feed it in through your CITES people, or you feed it in as a group, or if you want to do the SSC group, but, uh, you know, I don't know how you want to decide that here. I'm just, a, I'm just raising these questions to get the debate beyond, as the gentleman said, we'll be here next time discussing this, and we'll be here the next time discussing this. Yeah. I, want, I want some sort of, I'm just trying to... Madeline, actually, I, I just want to echo what Andrea has said. I've been thinking about this quite a bit. You know, if we if we resurrect the SSC, now I think you were on the last one, I was. It's a lot of work doing that red listing, and mm. all we're doing is creating a list of plants, some of which are critically endangered, and it, it, inevitably it's because of habitat loss. Yeah. So I don't really see what we're going to be achieving. We're going to make a rod for our own back. That's exactly right. But, but you're, you're, well, okay, you're contributing to the knowledge of carnivorous plants from a pure, they are threatened through habitat. You're contributing to the knowledge base whereby your country 
would be able to say, okay, Biblis, and then maybe the state of Victoria, whoever, wouldn't be able to build those houses on there because no, we threatened. So no, but they're also saying that it's not worth your while tissue culturing this thing because of all the rigmarole you've got to go through to move it around this earth of ours. Let's say he's got species A, in, 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 it's in the collection now, it's going to be. Tissue culture people. nepenthes can move around for appendix two species. Yeah, fine, but then Rob on one of his trips, or me on one of my trips, says, oh, look, that thing up on the top of the hill is, is threatened. Yeah. And it gets listed in appendix one. All of a sudden, for the last five years, uh, uh, 200,000 of this is going, going that way and 200,000 going this way, and all of a sudden, overnight, it's in appendix one, like Carziana. Uh, is threatened in the wild through habitat destruction. But when I was a kid, and it's still to this day, there's handfuls of seed available from hobbyists. You can't even sell it. No one wants it. If you say, I'd like some Carziana seeds, they'll give you bucketfuls of it. But it's right there on the top of the pile as being critically threatened, yes, That's in, in the field. Position, isn't it? Because India, it's India's only Nepenthes, and they wanted it listed as Appendix yes. One. Same thing with Raja. It's a, it's a political decision, as far as I can see. Correct me if I'm wrong, Madeline, but there's no logical reason. Well, they would have had, they would have had to present. Yeah. And the both, I think, were Raja, that. why not Bobitia, why, why not why not, Lisa, why not the others, which are equally endemic to this area? Exactly. That's, that's mm. my concern. If we now put in our knowledge and we really uh, say, okay, basically open the eyes of some people, show them that there are species which are really in danger, highly critically in danger, almost extinct, then suddenly... They're all in left on Appendix 1. Everything that... that uh, only if they're threatened through trade. trade. Yeah, but yes, but they don't care. They don't care. Mm -hmm. they yes, don't but okay, care. but a lot of those plants, I agree with you, went on quite early on. I think Kaziana and Raja were early. Listen, I can't... Very early. Yes, and, and, and yes, a lot of countries wanted a species on there, but that's where they can go through the review of significant trade. If there's absolutely no trade in them, then that pro they can be picked up. But that's where expert, your knowledge that you know that Kaziana and Raja are weeds needs to filter down to the people. I, I, I don't want all this on, you know, I'm not trying to get the, the camera away from me, but I want some debate with, with all well, of you to, dis to make some the, decisions. The you only clearly visible decision by the uh, member states that, that I can recognize is if they come to know that something is rare or threatened, they wouldn't ask whether it is by trade or anything else. But it, the only no, it does. The visible when measure they them. would take is list it in CITES no, 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 appendix. No, no, no. They have done the job and the rest, uh, rest is the business of enforcement. And where did they get the information from? From the guy that went up the Tapui, the guy that climbed up a mountain, the guy that crawled into the jungle? Certainly. Can I just say one thing? Um, if you went to the Conference of the Parties and saw the listing proposals, a lot of them don't get through the Plants Committee if you don't have enough information. Um, you, on a listing proposal, you have to prove. Otherwise, so the parties vote. They, don't, they vote for it not to be listed because you have to Nepenthes prove. You have to come up with two. trade data. If that was really evaluated, to. how come the whole genus was just generally... That's included? an identification problem. That is, unfortunately, the CITES... Yes, it, it can be a stumbling block, but unfortunately you have to sometimes put it. But that's where you can put in, you've got a generic listing, but they've taken off certain parts, and that's where the annotation, no. so when you do a proposal... There is no single apprentice species that is exempt. It's the whole of the genus, unless it's listed in an. What I'm saying to you now is you, as experts, you feed that information back to CITES, back to ICN, yeah, But we have want. fed on, most so of the information in the who, first CITES who, who checklist. The who, whoever reacted, what, what was really changed? Can I suggest that we do consider resurrecting the SSC? Because without something, we, we can't even give these people points forward. We don't have to do the, the, the check the red listing yet, necessarily. It's up to us, isn't it? But unless we actually have a proper group form, we can't even give these ideas that uh, you have to come up with. And we need to actually be able to have some forum to, to present this to people that can make a change. But in the same breath, Rob, you've got to be very careful with these people that they are another breed. They are above 
what we're about. And they will hang on every bit of information that we let out of our bags, our information. They'll take our information, they'll implode it in on itself, and you'll wind up with big rods on your back. I mean, they're not and that's the way it works. Said, for example, trying to help us. And I, hope so, and no, 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 I, I, I agree where she's coming from, and she has no control. Uh, I slightly think you're perpetuating the them and us theory here. Well, that, I, I believe it is a them and us. Uh, but many moons ago, when there was no CITES, back when I was a kid or a young man, and there was no CITES, the whole thing worked well. Um, the whole I, thing worked well. If I might cut in, with, because I think if we are going on like this, we'll be here something like tomorrow morning again, <laughs> until everybody is totally exhausted. I think if I look at the discussion, uh, the idea is basically how can we protect species, protect it in the wild, and still make it possible to reproduce the species. So it can be done, so it doesn't have to be done in the wild. And how can we make those two things work together? And I think the idea of a study group trying to figure out that there's that friction between collecting and reproducing uh, the species so it doesn't be, isn't threatened anymore because there is enough of it to go around. If we can have used the study group to work that out, people can earn a living, hobbyists can uh, enjoy their plants, but, but also there will be no more need to hunt for the plants. I mean, habitat destruction is a totally different problem that has a lot of factors which are out of control. But trade, which is the focus of CITES, we can control. And I think we really should, really the conclusion of this should be, let's reinstate the group to work out how we can do that, how we can make CITES work for us and not longer have a discussion, them and us. It's all of us because we all love the plants, we all want to protect them, and it's just a question how we're going to do it efficiently. Yeah, did I? Yeah. Uh, I would like uh, to add in another point, quite another one. Uh, in all these listings, maybe IUCN, this red list, or CITES, is there any chance to say, let's forget about the taxonomic levels below species and put everything which is distinct on species level? Because for, for just practical reason, um, if the, the taxonomic uh, view changes, then maybe uh, species which was uh, threatened is now falling into a subspecies of another one. For example, Pinguiga crystallina, which is really highly endangered, is only known from a single population of Cyprus, which is also a threatened, um, is now, of course, it belongs to Pinguiga heteriflora, and it's treated as a subspecies now, but on, on the, oh, the other way around, yeah. Uh, the Hirtiflora is a subspecies of Crystallina. The Crystallina is highly threatened, whereas Hirtiflora is widespread. And mm, just because not in Italy, <laughs> not in Italy, but oh, for, for other tags, uh, for example. And if you just put everything at the highest rank possible, for example, the species, you get, of course, very long lists which are not sometimes in uh, in agreement with the current taxonomic understanding. But I think for protection, it's important to to protect diversity and it's always better on the species level because everything which is written variety, subspecies, forma, is often neglected. And for example, then you have a dresser and nitidula which is widespread in Western Australia and oh there was subspecies like stigma, stigma which is just falls within this but if you do the species, it's dresser and stigma which is endemic just to one narrow spot. So but unless it's threatened through trade, CITES is no listing. Yes. There's absolutely no listing, so it's got absolutely, you know. Yeah, no, but then, 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 I'm, the then list, as yeah. a, uh, uh, then you're just talking about threat through habitat, or yes. it, that it's a very yeah. isolated so species. It was generally just for this list to, to use maybe the, the highest taxonomic rank, which was proposed, just the species rank. So the list gets longer, but you have to all diversity on that. Which depends is a threat through trade. Well, that's why I'm making a suggestion that, as you as experts, feed that information back into CITES to say, no, no, no. Exactly. I could tell you one of the is not threatened by drones, cars, the arms. That's why. It's cars, the arms. Yeah, that's why.
<laughs> um, first of all, let's try to keep it centralized. I mean, yeah. and I really, because we're talking and talking and talking, and I should say, I should say, um, we're not getting anywhere because everyone is adding his own points and keeps repeating them. But can we please focus on just a part of it so we can make one move forward? Because if we can only take one step at a time, so be it. But let's start moving. Right now we're all we're running around in circles. Everybody's saying the same thing again and again and again. Yeah, I, I would like to agree in a sense. Uh, so I think that we have two things now, and we should be maybe a little bit more pragmatic. So on the one hand side, we have the scientist discussion. Uh, we don't like it, but on the other hand, it's a fact, right? On the other side, we have the conservation issue, which we didn't touch at all. At the moment. Mm. So maybe it would be a good idea, let's say, to establish within the CP community more a group concerned about conservation issues, discussing that. It's not an IUCN specialist group, it's not called like that. Yeah, you could do it under the ICPS. You could or? use that forum, for example, to filter out information to IUCN if you want. If the group decides so, it's fine. Mm -hmm. If not, you keep it informal and uh, maybe discuss the matters and maybe publish the things that's all possible. But not as a as a formal IUCN group. Yeah, I mean that's and, uh, well, there, there is there is an uh, an officer on the ICPS board who's responsible for conservation issues. That's Brian Barnes at the moment, um, and most of the uh, most of the activities are coordinated through him. Uh, conservation projects mainly in the United States at the moment. Uh, but actually one of the goals of this discussion uh, should have been, I, I don't really know whether we have been very successful in this, to make proposals how to proceed with a view to implementation of ex situ conservation of carnivorous plants. Uh, now this has crystallized into, again, uh, a CITES <laughs> Discussion, which is perhaps not not very favourable. Yeah, I'm not coming to the next conference. <laughs> <laughs> You're on your own. <laughs> the, the problem is lack of communication is not appropriate communication. So uh, we even if if we perhaps don't like certain topics, we need to try to find a solution. Well, um, otherwise, I um, I. I you, you are a, a smaller group, I think, in your outlook. You, yes, you, you, you look at, no, but I mean in your, your scope, as it were. You, yes, you grow the plants and you move them around and you try and save them, but uh, um, I'm just trying to suggest the ways, and I, I, yeah. I agree with you, um, Michael, that it, 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 it doesn't have to be an SSC group, doesn't, you know, I just put that out there for the, for the people to, to discuss. It could be the ICPS, it could be you as individuals writing to your, you know, to the IUCN and saying, I, I've done, you know, Andreas, I've done all this field work, this would, what I would say these species are. Um, they're not threatened through trade, they're threatened through habitat loss, therefore I would give them this category or whatever. who are actually prepared to put this IUCN group together again, because it, it was um, a group that was existing. It fell apart for whatever reason, I don't know why. Um, and it seems ridiculous to get this red list going again, because it seems to be against conservation. Um, and no, I still don't understand why it's against conservation. Well, Ask yeah. the gentleman that's sitting next to you. No, because he's he's, he's Look, put uh, it very clearly that if we if you're not going to get the member states, are you, to, to say okay, we delist this. Just please, if, please make the decision. To, 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 or to I don't want to go around yeah. around the bush anymore. Just let's get people together that are, are prepared to go on onto this group, and possibly the way around is to have nurseries that are, um, whether it be Mr. Burr or
Antley or um, Solario here, that are, are going to be recognised as um, people who, who ha are propagating these, these species. Can I just uh, uh, say, points, we try to separate the issues into, into ex situ conservation and saying we should just talk about that and not about societies, but unfortunately, ex situ conservation is being severely hampered by the, the situation in societies. Okay, so how? Okay, you, right. Okay, that's the everybody agrees with that yes. here. Then, okay. So, if you don't agree with it, some people don't, some people do. What I'm saying to you is, how are you going to move that forward now, or are you just going to have a debate here and then we all go home and, and just get on with your, your lives? Or do you want you don't want the group? You don't want the group. You want it through the ICPS or, or whoever. You know, that's a. Very specific would like to be a part of this group. So who else is prepared to, I think we should start the group again and be very careful about what information we do actually oh, yeah, how we do. Yeah. But without some sort of formal group and, and we've got good contacts within the IUCN. Actually, we, we can at least have a body of people that, that can figure out a way to move forward. At least, as, as you said, I'm just going to walk away from here, hmm. and that's it. Now. Well, we can set up a working group within the International Climate with Plant Society, which can at some stage later decide where it wants to go. Yeah, I think maybe it needs a bit, you know, maybe, I don't know, if you think it needs more debate, you're not you're uh, totally in favour of it, or you actually want to walk away from here walk saying... Walk away with the people who are and help me out with this. Now, whether it ends up being IUCN or ICPS, we yeah. haven't yet decided, but we can, at least we need a, to know who would be willing to put in their time and effort voluntarily to try and push this forward after this meeting. I will, I will make a proposal for you. Yeah. I'm personally willing, and detaching from the ICPS because it has to be a board decision, but I'm perfectly willing to act like the sort of secretary. If some people will contact me, I want to be on this committee, I will bring them together, but we can use the internet email in the in first place uh, to set up an ID like what we should be talking about and who wants to join. Report in, we can set up some kind of guideline how we can start the talks and then we can decide whether we go for an official more or less way through the IUCN or the or a less official way through the ICPS so that we can have at least a structured talk of people trying to prepare for a way to make a change. Can I just also add to that, um, I talked to IUC, well the SSC chair Simon Stewart before I came here and said if, if people decided they wanted to resurrect the group um, he said that if you want to nominate a chair for that group, they, they send their CVs into Simon and then I, and they have a look at it and, and then they go from there. And I think whatever the group or whatever you, decisions are made, I think you do need to have some discussion with SSC so you, you're happy with the way they run the groups or, or whatever the remit is or stuff like that as well. Because you might not like it and you might just say, no, I'd rather do it through the ICPS or I'd rather just do it as my person. You know, I'm Joe Bloggs living in the UK, that's the way I'm going to do it. So I think that needs some discussion with them as well. And to get away probably from, from the side issue, it's usually always, and I'm speaking about ex situ conservation, for example, if I discover the plant, new plant, which is threatened, which is rare, just known from one location, and I have the collection permit, the national collection permit for a certain country to make a very specimen for scientific research. For most countries it says no commercial use. So if I have a plant, a fruiting plant, preserve it for my description, there are a few seeds falling out and I give them to a friend who takes them in vitro, propagates them to conserve this plant. I'm already actually acting illegal. That's why I would, for, of course, keep these actions secret. I don't so, say that I'm doing this. But practically, this is what I would suggest to do this for, to these people. If you discover a new plant... <laughs> but Andrea, with, have... with respect, you're widening the issue again. And it's just, let's focus on something we can do. We can add things later, but start somewhere. Yeah. But it's not starting anywhere because everybody keeps adding their own point and 
isn't to you the big picture anymore. Yeah, I mean, your proposal is it's unrealistic. Uh, it's it's impossible to write, to hope that you get permission for a commercial. This may, I, may I say something at last? This discussion was actually the kickoff of something we hoped that was something coming up. I mean, all the ICPS meetings have been without any discussion. So this was a tryout to see whether something would come out. In fact, something did. We have a kind of continuation for the next ICPS meeting. But first, you need to organize your group. So let's say this, you got a year to organize for a group. You make a plan and bring this for the next ICPS meeting because this continues, you know, will not end next week. Is that a, is it a plan or is that an idea? Or Marcel, you said you could say to the secretary. Yes, yeah, so, so, so if you report to me, I'll arrange things together. I don't know if I will stay inside the group, but I will help you pull together. And so, if you need information about contact thread, whatever I know, you can consult me, so I would join. Yeah, I think we should be interested in the first instance, so we can compile a list. And, and then. Sorry. And I, I will supply you with the people in SSC to contact to discuss it further. and. And you would like to be the chairman of Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think I'll be sure you're right. On this note, can we conclude, conclude this discussion so we can start preparing things and yes, use it for a next conference to continue going in the right direction together? Is that a good idea? Yes? Yeah? Okay. Okay. By the way, the 2000 ICPS conference, there was a meeting a bit like this um, for the Nepenthes 50 Arts Survival Project, and a group was formed. And actually, a lot of work was done behind the scenes. It failed, but that was for simply what we were trying to achieve. It wasn't practical, but we did try. So it hasn't yeah. been done before. And people did do a lot of work in the background. So you can find you know, people are willing to actually put in the effort, I'm sure. But as you said, the first thing is to get a list of people who are willing to do something. Well, the thing is, 90% of the members of the anti gathering or it's something like that being on the other side of the Atlantic, there are a lot of people that yeah. might want to be involved in this group that aren't involved in this meeting here. If you want to keep it very small. <laughs> yeah, I want to keep it small. We can't really just do it here. Well, we were very lucky to have Madeline here who's willing to actually help us make the introductions to the, to the necessary people if we do decide to go the IUC. <coughs> so I, I'm actually rather skeptical about that, actually, um, after listening to Andreas' opinion. But please, I think, contact me. We can see what's feasible. We can produce something for the next ICPS so we can try to go in the following direction. Everybody, I think everyone has my email, otherwise, I will gladly give it. Also, provide yourself, or, and maybe people you think should be on it. I will pull something together, and then we can see if we can achieve something more structured at the next conference to take another step in the next uh, direction. So, with that, I would really like to conclude this conference, this discussion. Um, I'd like to thank everyone very much for their attendance, and especially the people who were willing to sort of impromptu form a panel. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> to form something like impromptu of a panel so we can have a form of this discussion. And really, thank you all very much. We hope we do and have enjoyed it. We hope you will enjoy the rest of the program if you subscribe to the excursions. And thank you all very much for coming.